Um, you know, bef on a serious note, before we begin, it is Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow's Memorial Day, and um, it's right that we pause and we just honor all those who served to preserve our freedoms and the freedoms enjoyed around the world. Um, we've lost our way in this country, but the men and women who gave their all understood the foundation that this country was founded upon, and they laid down their lives, and so we honor that. Okay. Um, so we've been doing a series on, uh, called This Is Our Why, and uh, you know, today we're going to focus on another statement, which is you can't outgive God. And so, you know, the, uh, before you put the next slide up, it's quiz time, folks. Saved people. Serve people. <laughs> Somebody's like, somebody was on a delay. Uh, <laughs> uh, found people. Okay, all right. And last week we looked at what? <laughs> God's will is... Growth, that's right. God's will is growth. We're working on this. We're working on it. So uh, that's good. Go ahead and put that, that slide up. So that's the statement. We, we have some core values that we're building in, into the community, and they're statements not only of faith, but also of action and purpose. So we know that found people find people. We know that saved people serve people. We know that God's will is growth. And um, today, we're focusing on you can't outgive God and we'll continue to look at those other ones. But, you know, um, so here's the thing. Um, I realize on Sunday mornings um, that as we gather together, and I know some people are traveling today, but as we gather together, um, some people are coming in with their last hope, with, with struggles, with fighting the realities of their life. Sometimes it's addiction. Sometimes it's sin-based. Sometimes it's stuff that has nothing to do with them, but they're being forced into situations to deal with things. And, and I know that. And so I, I know what it's like, and I felt it, to come to church and just feel empty uh, and just saying, God, I just, I just need a word. I just need to worship you because I just feel nothing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I know that, and I hope that uh, you find those moments of refreshing here. Um, if, if that's not the case for you, um, and you are, um, you know, you're, you're doing pretty okay, I hope that you come praying for other people that may not be. I hope that you come with a sense of mission. God, who can I serve? Who can I bless today? God, help me to be a point of light, a point of rescue for somebody, even if it's a simple comment, God. Use me today. But, but I do want to ask, you know, maybe, maybe you're here, and, and have you ever just been so desperate? Uh, have you ever had your back against the wall, and, and you didn't know where to turn to? And, and you know, have you ever been in need, and you, you couldn't see the way, any way, to have that need met? Um, well, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, and I, I didn't say believer in Jesus, uh, that, that's not what we're talking about. If, if you've heard anything over the last several months that we've been together, I hope that you see me drawing a line of distinction between belief in God and belief that God can kind of do things versus uh, somebody who has taken that belief to the point of surrender to become a follower of Jesus, imperfectly, as we all do, but imperfectly following him because we trust him. Uh, but if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, he wants you to turn your life over to him and experience his goodness. Uh, he wants you to experience the wonder of knowing that he is enough, even in the most extreme, difficult situations in this life. He is enough. You talk to enough people who have been following Jesus for an, enough time, you will hear stories of how, I didn't know if I was going to make it or not, but Jesus was enough. You know, the Bible clearly calls us to walk by faith 
Uh, but sometimes us Christians get our eyes on the way of the world around us. And it's easy to do. I'm not throwing shade this morning. You know, we have decisions to make all the time, and we try to do our best. But in those moments, it's easy to drift from faith into feelings. It's easy to look upon the waves and the storm rather than the one who's calling you out. It's easy to drift into thinking that we are on our own and it's up to us. We walk by faith, the Bible says, not by sight. But what does that mean? We'll say it, we'll preach it, we'll, we'll recount it. But what does it look like? What does that mean? And, and so essentially it means that there is more going on than what we see. Uh, it means that God is not some distant being who is barely aware of our struggles and is just trusting us to figure it out. The story of the Bible from Genesis to Maps is a God who comes running to us, who, who involves himself in our struggles and our trials. He, he's there with us. He doesn't just say, go figure it out. It means that the activity of God's Spirit is all around us. And we walk unaware so often, but God is at work all around us. And it means that He is constantly, constantly trying to get you to trust Him more. Every day is a battle to trust Him more. It also means that your best life is hidden from your sight, but it can be found in trusting Him more. You know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of times people pray, which is good, but they pray for more stuff um, or better stuff. Um, or um, feeling-based needs. They pray for... Uh, better jobs, uh, you know, new relationships. They, they pray for better feelings on the inside. Um, they, they chase experiences that, that make them feel alive, but that's just adrenaline, and it quickly fades. You know, people will spend money at the casinos chasing a thrill, but they won't obey God in the tithe. People will build a nest egg in this world, but neglect their internal, eternal inheritance. Yeah, I'm messing with all y'all today. You know, the Bible has a lot to say, a lot to say about our attitudes and practices with money in this world. But uh, we're not even here really just talking about that today. We talk all the time about t time, you know, giving of our time giving of our talent. What has God put inside of you? And it's, it's not for you to simply consume. It is for you to give. You are blessed to be a blessing. What skills do you have? What talents do you have? Invest those in the kingdom of God in some way. Time and talent and treasure. You know, we're taught, we, you've heard this morning like several opportunities for you to sign up and serve in a way that will probably make, it will make an eternal difference in each and every case. And the way that people are determining those choices, whether to get involved or not, is they say, hmm, do I have enough time? I'm kind of busy. I've got my life to live. And what that does is, and I'm just, I'm, my notes are gone, but what we do is we, we operate from a spirit of lack. Do you, do you, know, do you know that? Um, you know, when we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know that, that that's not talking about we're not going to have any desires. It's not talking about I won't ever want anything. It's talking about lack. The Lord is my shepherd, I will not lack but that's how we operate all the time. When we make decisions on what to give, we stare at our, at our little pile, right? Whether it's time or whether it's our bank account. And we stare at that and we like, hmm, okay, how much of that do you think we can give? 
How much, how much of this time pile? Maybe, maybe a little bit of that, or, or you know, maybe a little bit of that money. And that's how we make decisions. That's, the, that's operating in a spirit of lack because we, we operate by faith. We, we, we know the God who owns it all, but we won't trust Him like that. Yeah, I thought it might be quiet, but, um, you know, we know that God's will is growth. So how does that work? We, you know, how do, we, how do we grow in this area? How do, we, how do we spill up and over our current container, our current understanding, our current practices in this, in this area? How do we grow in this area? You know, we want God to just fill up our current container. Oh, God, my little container here is, I, I see it shrinking a little bit. Uh, could you just fill it back up a little bit? When God's looking in and say, your container is small. I'm trying to get you to trust me with more so I can give you a bigger container, and then I'll fill that one up, and that'll overflow, and then I'll give you another bigger container, and I'll fill that up too. But we operate based on our tiny little understandings. God is a God of growth and increase. And again, let me say this clearly, as I said last week, I am not talking about a prosperity gospel. Do not confuse that. You can watch last week's message if you think that. But... Um, <clears throat> So he will stretch you, he will change you, so your container is able to handle more. And in church, let me speak to us collectively for a moment. How do we grow into possessing the land that we've been given for God's purposes? How do we do that? Because we're operating based on this container. Your expectations are based, you feel good when the seat's on Sunday morning in here are mostly filled. Woo, it's a good Sunday today, Pastor. And I'm looking at it like, I want to be two services. I want us to build another building. I want overflow. Don't look at this and be content. How do we do that? How do we grow into possessing the land that we've given? I'm, I'm calling that the back 40. I, and listen, don't yell at me. I know it's not 40 acres. It's just a thing. It's like a movie reference somewhere. I don't know. But the back 40. All you farmers are like, it's not 40 acres. Mate. I don't know. It might be. But that's just what I'm calling it. But how do we grow into possessing that? Right? It wasn't meant... To grow corn, that might have been the answer at the time that that decision was made yet several years ago. And I'm not dogging that, but I'm saying God has given us that land for more, for ministry, to see souls touched and changed, to see families restored. Ah! So how do we possess that land? Is it a passive thing? Do we just... Here. God, we're just waiting for you to just give it. Just, just give it. Now, I'm not saying that waiting on God is bad. In fact, that's part of God's purpose for us, to teach us things and waiting. But I'm saying it's not a passive thing. It's not something <clears throat> that God will do independently of his people's actions and faith and posture. I'm preaching good, y'all, and you're all just staring at me. Like, why is he sitting down there? I'm trying to make a point. We don't serve fate. We serve a God who is active and has chosen to act upon his people's prayers and, his, and their sacrifices and their work. And, and, and that's the God we serve who interacts with us and responds to faith. Listen, there's things in this world that God's going to accomplish independently of us because it's his sovereign will. There's calendar things and, you know, end time stuff. He's going to accomplish that no matter what. But he's looking for people who are hungry enough, desperate enough, 
and willing enough to do the work and to pray hard enough and love hard enough for him to be able to pour into that community so that there is growth and expansion. And it's not about, listen, it's not just numbers, it's people. And people have stories, and people have struggles, and that's why numbers are important, because numbers are people. It would take a miracle for a church to not only come back from shutdowns and COVID, but to also explode in healthy growth, expansion, and building. Boy, it's a good thing my God does miracles. I'm going to give you a key this morning. Where am I at? I'm going to give you the key to seeing things in your life. Maybe you're stagnant. Maybe you're bored. (laughs) I don't understand that, but um, maybe you're bored with Uh, God and Christianity, well, I promise you that if you're following where God is trying to lead you, you will not be bored. But I'm going to give you the key to see some real breakthrough and miraculous things happen in your life. You know, the Bible says that only God can grow the church, right? But does that mean we do nothing? So here's the thing. One, One simple verse one verse I'm going to look at this morning, and, it's, uh, and you've probably heard it before. Um, I hope so, <laughs> you know. I mean, you might, you might be coming and visiting and none church. That's fine. But if you've been in church for a minute, I hope you've heard these words before. But Luke 6.38 says this, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. Anybody remember the old Ron Cannoli song? Give, and it will come back to you. Okay, all right. I know. I know. Yes, I'm old. Thank you. Uh, Important to your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Boom. That's a... Okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so here's the thing. Number one, it starts with giving. It starts there. It starts with giving. Give, and you will receive. We go to God and ask for more all the time, but are you giving? Or are you asking for the more when you haven't even given yet? You know, we know that we have salvation because Jesus first gave to us. He gave it all. If, if you have called on his name, then you have been called into a new life, but perhaps you're still living according to the old life, but the Spirit is trying to train you and I to become more like Jesus every day. Do you know that? Every day. But as a simple matter of understanding, let me, let me just ask you this. Why would he trust you with more, the thing you've been praying for, when you can't even be obedient with what he's already entrusted to you? Give, and it will be given unto you. It starts with giving. As Michelle said earlier, it's the only place in the Bible where God says to test him because he knows that we would rather trust our money, we'd rather trust our stuff than trust God because it makes us feel like we have the power. But he says, trust me. Trust me in the time. If you, haven't, if you don't, start. It's not too late. Just start. And listen, if you never give a, let me say this. If you never give a dime to this church, we're still going to love you. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm trying to give you something, not get something from you. But unless you learn and you say and you practice, 
I will not be ruled by my checkbook. I will not feel like I'm living in victory based on the amount of my checkbook, and I won't feel defeated when I look and there's nothing there. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to be obedient to him, and that will define what I do with money. Money is not my God. Jesus is. But until you learn this, if he gave you more, it would destroy you. It would own you. People who are givers understand that we are to hold what we have with loose and open hands as wise and obedient stewards, not owners. You know, sometimes people turn away from God uh, in, in, offen- in offense um, for what he did not do. Or the answer was slow in their reckoning, or, or, or it was a no. Uh, you know, you... you God, you didn't give me what I prayed for, so I'm taking my ball and going home. And another thing with this, what we see is, uh, it's not, it doesn't say give to receive. It's not a formula. It's not an investment. It's a promise. But it's not a formula. Listen, if you gave and never got anything back, you should still be grateful for everything you have. Because all of us are starting from an eternal deficit already because he gave everything for us. And if he never never did another thing for us in this life, he's already done way more than he should have. I deserved hell, and I got heaven instead. And if that was all he ever did, I'm grateful. But he doesn't. He does more. Every day, he does more. It's only grace that God honors our giving through returning to us and blessing us back. Give, and it will be given. You know, Romans 11, 33 through 36 says this, Oh, how great are God's riches in wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who, can know enough, who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes by him and exists for his power, and it is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Listen, God is no man's debtor. He owns it all. He entrusts us with some. And if you're a wise steward, obedient steward, he will entrust you with more. That is the biblical paradigm. Amen. Amen. Okay, next, next slide. He says, not only will he give it back to you, but it will be pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. And then running over so that it pours into your lap. Picture, if you will, a basket being filled with grain and and, and it's being poured in there. And then it's shaken so that all the air and loose parts get out of it. And then you press it down to make room for more because you're getting the good stuff, right? You're getting it and you press it down. And then he keeps on going to where it's pouring out of the basket into your lap. You're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think this would happen. This is crazy. That's the picture we have. God is generous. You know, this week at prayer on Tuesday night, I hope you can join us sometime. It's an hour we put on loud worship music, and uh, we pray through some areas. We put slides up, and it just the time just goes quickly. But, um, but at this, this week at prayer, I felt like uh, God just spoke a word. And this, this week has been crazy because... Uh, you know, I'd love to tell you that every week I just feel the, the Spirit so strong and just moving on me and just, but, it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, just working through it the best I can. I have bad weeks too. But, you know, this week and just, uh, you know, creating the notes and praying and just thinking about it, I was in tears several times, just, you know, thinking about His goodness. And so this, this uh, Tuesday... You know, I just felt like God spoke a simple word, which was overflow, uh, overflow. And that just captured my heart. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. 
That's the picture all throughout the Bible when it comes to giving is, is overflow, overflow, overflow. And I began to think about the loaves and the fishes. I, I began to think about uh, Elisha and, and, and the widow and, and how it just kept coming. It was overflow and people around them were blessed and just it's overflow, overflow, overflow. Overflow. And we make decisions from a spirit of lack. How much can we spare? How much can we spare? I think about Jesus sitting at the temple. He's watching as people are giving. And he's watching Pharisees come and make a big show of what they're giving and all this stuff. And then he sees a widow who gives two mites, two tiny little coins, you know, like two pennies. And he, he tells his disciples, and he says, did you see that? Did you, did you see that? The, these people are giving out of their abundance, but she just gave everything she has. And, and, and that's the end of the dialogue there's nothing more. I, I'm like, well, what happened? I want to know the, what, what happened. But, I, I mean, I can fill in the blanks. Do you, I mean, do you think that this woman who gave all that she had then went and starved to death? Or do you think maybe because God was watching, he made something happen to where she not only got those two mites back, but she was blessed with overflow? That's the thing. When you come up here and you give out of obedience, and maybe sometimes it hurts, I don't know. Maybe I don't know what you're going through. But Jesus is sitting there like, oh, man, that's good. Boy, he's trusting me with that. He's trust. I know, I know he's looking at his bills, and I know. But, man, I know he just walked up there, and he was obedient. That's good. Boy, he hasn't even been paid yet. He, he, boy, they're, they're talking about maybe she, she might lose her job. She might lose her job. She's facing that. But I just saw her trust me. I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow out their container. I'm going to give them. I'm going to bust it out. I saw that. I saw that. My God is the God of overflow. And the next slide, which is the, just the punch is the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Now, there's, there's room for misunderstanding here. This is not a one-to-one -one ratio. You give X, you get X back. That's not what we're talking about. Remember, we serve a God who is a God of overflow. What we're talking about with this, the amount you give, is the amount of joy, the amount of faith, the amount, the, the heart attitude, the heart posture in which you give. There are people who will give out of religious obligation who, boy, you, you, you just, God loves a cheer, cheerful giver, right? And so, you know, he, he was dealing with Pharisees all the time who did things for show and obligation, but he was looking at the hearts it may, not, and it may not even be the same type as what you gave that you get back, but God is no man's debtor. It's about the heart. There, there is not a more generous being in all the universe than my God. He will always outdo you. Always. So this week, uh, I put out a... Uh, I'm not just surfing my phone here, so. Hold on, I got a notification. Um, I, put, I put out a, uh, a request, and I asked people to share, um, you know, what are some ways, how did I phrase it? Um, what's your story on how giving has impacted your life? And so I, I, be, I began to get to people's responses. I want to read you some of them, okay? Because here's the deal. People will look at me talking about this and be like, oh, well, he's a pastor and blah, 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 and blah. I want you to hear from, like, uh, I guess, other people. Okay, so here's one from Heather. About a year ago, we got a call from a Chi Alpha missionary raising support. I felt like the Lord wanted us to pick her up personally, but literally the night before 
our washing machine quit. I had tendonitis starting in my foot, and I needed a better, better pair of shoes. And we were also trying uh, to save for a down payment for a house. The Lord spoke to my heart saying, you have three talents and need 300 anyway. Why not give what you have? Do you have faith to give or will you give, uh, or will you give in faith? So we picked her up, meaning they picked up support of the Chi Alpha missionary. Um, by the end of the week, a friend called to say their neighbor was selling a washing machine for $50. It was like new. And I found the perfect pair of shoes on clearance in my size. In fact, they were the only pair like that in any size. In just a few months, we bought a house with a bigger down payment than we thought possible. No one wrote us a check. We didn't find $1,000 extra in our bank account, but somehow God multiplied and increased our finances. We picked up two more missionaries not long after that. My husband said, God bless us with more than enough, so let's keep giving it back. Oh, I love that. Man, it's not like you then get it and then hang on to it. It's this awesome cycle of giving, and God returns, and we give more. So here's another. Um, um, so during a period of time when we were hit with financial hardship beyond our control, we did not stop tithing. No matter what the dollar amount was based on income or lack of it, we tithed and gave. Looking back, we can see that God protected us for, for, from foreclosure. We had food to eat. In fact, we were able to pay down debt better than we had at our previous level of income. We stayed faithful in our giving, and what we sowed, we reaped. Anybody sensing a theme? Okay, I'll keep going. So, um, I could go on and on about this subject. I began to, and believe me, this, this woman could go on and on about this subject. Uh, but uh, I began tithing above and beyond the 10%. What? Give more than the tithe? What? That's crazy. Um, two to three years ago, and give it joyfully. I no longer even use a, a check register. God has blessed me over and over. All of my tithes go to my local church. Come on now. And then I give to missions on a monthly basis. And then I just give. Extra tips to service workers, random people and checkout lines, a stranger's lunch. God takes those blessings and gifts and multiplies them and blesses me. I recently got a $2,000 hospital bill, which my insurance denied because I wasn't dying enough. No problem. God came through with an unexpected bonus, more than the amount of the bill. He's just that good. Yeah. Oh, I'm not done. So, gosh, there's so much here. I don't care. Joseph and I started Financial Peace University this year. We got on track with our tithe and missions and actually started giving more per month to a fund that the church does to help many causes. Before we even finished the first week, we were blessed with a random $500 from a family member, a check for about $450 on an account that was supposed to be closed the year before, and I received a letter stating our medical bills were waived and we had a zero balance. Compared to what we were gifted with from our God uh, for our giving seems so small, but we haven't missed a chance to give since. Oh, that's just coincidence. That's just coincidence. Hmm. Okay, I got one more. When Gary and I were in Bible school, we had less than what we needed for the next semester in the bank, but we felt like God wanted us to give it all towards another student. You ever been there? We did it, trusting that the Lord, trusting the Lord was. Uh, uh, it's a big step, especially for my husband. Uh, a few days later, another student approached us and secretly gave us the entire amount we needed for the next semester as the Lord had been prompting him to trust and bless us. I mean, there's more. Go on my Facebook page and read them if you want, but uh, Jackie has a story she shared on there, Rhonda, uh, Sonia. Um, gosh, there's There's more. But do you, do you catch the theme? It is, I'm staring at lack or a, a perceived deficit, 
but I'm going to give based on what I feel like the Lord's saying anyway. And so they, uh, like the Macedonian churches that Paul talks about, out of their poverty they gave, and then God blesses them back more than they even thought. Do, do you see? It, 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 is faith rising in you this morning? I hope so. Um, I mean, miracles. Miracles. That's the God. He still does miracles. He still does them. We just don't trust him enough to see him. I mean, in many cases, you don't see miracles because your faith is weak. Because you'd rather trust your money than God. You want miracles of deliverance from situations that you keep creating. You don't follow the Spirit when He leads you into an area where you have to trust Him. That's scary. That's not wise. You don't obey Him when He speaks something counter to conventional wisdom. You say, I believe God can do it, but following the Spirit's lead will maneuver you into the position where if God doesn't do it, you're toast. So, as a pastor, um, I have tried my best to follow this. I don't always get it right. But when it comes time for decisions, I'd never make decisions rooted in fear. At least I try not to. I try to have wisdom. I'm not reckless. But there are decisions made where, like, I don't know how it's going to work out. But I trust it will. Like the decision to not plant corn and put grass out there so we can use it for Creekside Palooza coming up on Labor Day weekend and, you know, and different things. And, and the, de- the decision to push forward, even not knowing how it's going to work out. I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm just trying to follow the cloud. I don't know. But I've seen him do it. A million times. One, two, three, four. I can't even count them all. A million little miracles. So here I am again. And I'm in a place of need, personally. Um, I've been holding off sharing this because so many things can go wrong. But um, we've bought a house. And uh, <laughs> we just paid more money than I, or at least we're about to pay more money for a house than I ever thought I would. But that's just the market and whatever. I'm not going to get into that. Um, and we have two kids in college. <laughs> and so, like, I'm looking at that, and we, believe me, we prayed all the way through it. But I'm looking at all that saying, God, I have no idea how you're going to do this. But I believe you will. I believe you will. So this is what I want to do this morning. I want to teach you something. How, is there anybody in this place? And I'm sorry, online doesn't count this time. But anybody in this place who you are facing a need. You're, you're facing a need that you don't know how God, how it's going to work out. You just, you, you, a financial need, particularly a financial need. Um, how many of you are facing a financial need that you're worried and you just don't see how it's going to happen, how the need's going to be met? Raise your hand up. I'm looking for five people. Come on up, Lacey. Hey, who else? How many other people? You're facing a need. Come on. Come on. Two more. Two more people. We're not moving any further until I get two more people. 
And it may not even be a financial need. It may be something else critical in your life. But um, who else? Two more people. I'm serious. I'm not moving on until I know that there's five people here. And you don't have to tell me what it is, okay? <laughs> you don't have to, whatever. But, uh, okay? One more. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, I think uh, I, I only have room for five. So she, uh, okay. All right. So could you all scoot over here and like stand here? Because I'm going to talk to you and them through this. So, I'm, yeah, that's right. You're on display. That's right. So here's the deal. Um, as I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm facing a need that I, I just, uh, it's more house that, than I thought. Um, the kids in college, uh, in the natural, in the flesh, the budget calculating just doesn't work. I'm scared. I need some of that miracle manna, right? So I'm looking at God once again, and I'm saying, God, you need to, you need to prove once again like you have to me so many times that you are my source, not my job, not my income, not anything else, but you are my source. And so, um, so in this envelope, I have five $100 bills, and this is my money. It's not the church's money. I could have used the church's money. I'm not. This is my money that I earned. And so what I want to do is, is to give each of you one of these. And then hold on just a second. So here's the deal. Even as a church, we're facing some needs coming up. We have an important board meeting this Thursday where we're going to talk about some stuff. And we may, um, good stuff, but just, you know, stuff costs money. And so uh, we're going to be meeting, and then maybe coming back to you as a church and, and doing the whole business meeting kind of thing. Um, you know, we need the parking lot taken care of. We need different things taken care of. So, um, but here's the deal. This is seed money for you, um, I, and maybe you don't get it, but um, it, it, and it is no longer my money. I have given it to you. It is yours to do with as you please, um, but the intention is you're up here with a need, okay? Um, you can consume the seed if you want to. You can consume the seed but how many know if you plant seed and wait on God, you reap a harvest? Um, uh, so you can take the seed and position yourself for a greater miracle, because I'm not trying to teach anybody, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but I'm not trying to teach anybody dependence upon the church or me or anything for their provision. I'm trying to connect them to God. I'm trying, you know... We don't give a fish, we teach people how to fish, right? My job is not just to teach, but equip. So, um, so here's the thing. I'm not a simple Bible teacher, I'm a faith teacher. I'm going to put it into practice. And so you choose, but what I want you to do is I want each of you to pray this week that God will lay somebody else on your heart for you to give the money that you've been given, that you need that you give it away to them. Doesn't that seem absurd? Yeah, I mean, they, they're in need. They said they're in need, but I'm asking them to pray about giving it away to somebody else. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the biblical pattern, isn't it? And so I want you to spend time in worship and prayer, meditation on God's Word, and say, God, sometime this week, steer me to somebody that I can bless with this. Um, but it's yours. Do with it as you wish. Consume it if you need to. Uh, but I'm trying to teach you something that, because I'm done. I've done what God laid on my heart to do, and results of it, I, I, that's not my problem. That's God's area, right? I just do what God tells me to do, and I, I just, whatever. 
But um, So I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, each of you, in the middle of your need about how you, know, you can bless somebody else. I want you to, maybe he lays a name on your heart or directs your step to somebody this week or, or, or somebody that God is going to use you to be the miracle that somebody else is praying for. Gosh, I love this, man. This is Christianity. This is biblical Christianity. And even as you're believing for God to meet your need, you're going to be his provision to meet somebody else's need. And when you get to heaven, each of you, and when God puts your life on replay, you're going to be able to watch and celebrate how, wow. You know, Jesus is going to be like, you know, in your moment of need, you trusted me. And I was able to use you to be an answer to somebody else's prayer. But you already know that after that, I, I blessed you back and you had no lack in that. Time. But in that moment of your need, you trusted me to be an answer to somebody else. And look at how you'll be able to see the replay of heaven standing up. Like, like as, as Stephen, the first deacon, was being stoned to death uh, because of his faith and how it says he looked up and Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. But, but what's the Bible say everywhere else about where Jesus is at? What's it say? He's, it says he's seated at the right hand of God, but in this vision, Stephen was standing at the right hand of God. So I believe that as, as Jesus was watching what happened, he leaped to his feet and said, did you see that? Yes. Well done, Stephen. Well done. Did you see that, Father? Did you see that, angels? Look at that. He's doing that for me. That's the kind of faith I want us to have. And then I want you to watch as you respond to God in faith, and you give out of your need, man, I want you to see the miracle that's going to come. It's up to you. And I'm not, I'm not going to chase you down. Be like, What'd you do with it? It's your money. But I want you to trust God with it. And if you have a cool story, I'd love to hear it. But man, I just believe God's going to do something. I mean, won't he do it? Won't he do it? We have some big needs at the church coming because we have some big dreams. If we were content with this, we we'll just make do. But I have responded in faith to what I believe that God is saying to us. And if, if God doesn't come through, we're toast. But we'll go down swinging in faith. This whole building, and you can be seated, thank you. I know it's, you're not, it's not the greatest to be standing everywhere, but thank you all. Um, you know, I was talking with uh, Jim about this building this week, and, and I, the stories I've heard and how it came to be, and just um, all the problems that happened with the land, the building, the city, the codes, all this stuff, and like... The headaches and the, the, the maintenance and different things because maybe it wasn't done the best or whatever. But listen, we're here today worshiping, proclaiming the word of God. And I'm thankful for those that took the leap of faith. Maybe it didn't go smoothly. I don't care. We're here in these times before the Lord returns proclaiming the goodness of God, and I'm thankful for those who took the leap. Won't he do it? You can't outgive my God. Do you know him? Do you know him? Would you stand with me?
I'm going to have the team come on back. Um, so here's the thing. I, just, I feel God in the room. And so um, what I want to do is if you, if you need prayer, do you need a miracle? Maybe it has nothing to do with finances, but maybe you need a miracle, uh, a healing touch. Um, you, you need something. Then I want to pray for you. And it's not about me, but I'm just, I just feel like God wants to do something. So we're going to have the team play. And listen, if you're concerned about the clock, I get it. Um, at, at any time that you feel that you need to go, you're, you're dismissed. God bless you. We love you. Um, but we're going to stick around for a minute and, uh, and just pray. So if you're here, first of all, and you don't know Jesus, you're not following Jesus, and you want to, would you shoot your hand up real quick and just say, I want to follow him. I'm tired of stale, boring Christianity. It just, it's not about belief. It's about putting that belief into practice. Quickly, up and then down. Secondly, if you're here tonight, uh, tonight, if you're here this morning and you need an answer, you need a miracle, would you raise your hand up real quick? Say, I just, I, God, I need you. I don't know how this is going to work out. I just need you. Would you come up? Would you come up here to this place that we call the altar? And would you come and listen, if you're concerned about how you look, then you're probably not ready for your miracle. But if you're desperate enough, come on up. Come on up and let's pray. And let's ask God to do what only He can do. Can we do that? Maybe you need a healing.